We are in a light, attractive and comfortably furnished room. On the right there are French windows opening onto the garden. On the left there is an open fireplace. At the back on the left there are double doors leading to the dining room. Up left, at a slight angle, are double doors leading to the hall, the stairs and the servants' quarters. It is about eight o'clock on a summer evening. There is a wood fire burning because it is an English summer evening. The maid, Edith, comes in from the hall, carrying rather uneasily a large tray of cocktail things. She comes to a centre table with a tray of drinks, sees there is not room, so puts it on a drinks table, to the right, with a sigh of relief. Ruth enters briskly, a smart-looking woman in her middle thirties. She is dressed for dinner, but not elaborately. That's right, Edith. Yes, ma'am. Now you'd better fetch the ice bucket. Yes, ma'am. Did you manage to get the ice out of those little tin trays? Yes, ma'am, I did have a bit of a struggle, though. But it's all right. And you filled the little trays up again? With water? Yes, ma'am. Good. Very good, Edith. You're making giant strides? Yes, ma'am. Oh, by the way, Madame Arcati, Mrs. Bradman and I will have our coffee in here after dinner. Mr. Condamine and Dr. Bradman will have theirs in the dining room. Is that quite clear? Yes, ma'am. Well, and when you're serving dinner, Edith, try to remember to do it calmly and methodically. Yes, ma'am. As you are not in the Navy, it is unnecessary to do everything at the double. Very good, ma'am. Now, go and get the ice. Yes, ma'am. Not at a run, Edith. Yes, ma'am. Oh, dear. Ah, there you are. No sign of the advancing hordes. Not yet, Charles, dear. <laughs> nice. It's coming. I've been trying to discourage Edith from being quite so fleet of foot. You mustn't mind if everything's a little slow motion tonight. I would welcome it. The last few days have been extremely agitating. What do you suppose induced Agnes to leave us and go and get married? The reason was becoming increasingly obvious, dear. Yes, but in these days nobody thinks anything of that sort of thing. She could have popped into the cottage hospital, had it, and popped out again. Her social life would have been seriously undermined. We must keep Edith in the house more. Ah, that's right, Edith. Put the ice bucket down on the table. Yes, ma'am. Oh, I left my cigarette case on my dressing table, Edith. Would you get it for me? Yes, sir. There now. She went at a rate of knots. Well, you took her by surprise. Dry martini, I think, don't you? Yes. I expect Madame Arcati will want something sweeter. Well, we'll have this one for ourselves, anyhow. Pass me a cigarette, would you? Feeling a little uh, apprehensive? I do have a feeling that this evening is going to be awful. It'll probably be funny. Not awful. And you must promise not to catch my eye. If I giggle, and I'm very likely to, it'll ruin everything. You mustn't. You must be dead serious, if possible, a little intense. We can't hurt the old girl's feelings, however funny she is. But why for Bradman's, darling? He's as sceptical as we are. He'll probably say the most dreadful things. I've warned him. And there must be more than three people. We couldn't have a vicar and his wife, because, well, A, they're dreary, and B, they probably would not approve at all. It had to be for Bradman's. Cigarette case, sir. <sighs> Thank you, Edith. <laughs> Steady does it. Yes, sir. That's it. Oh, dear. Perhaps we should make her walk with a book on her head, like they do in deportment lessons. There. Try this for size. Mm, lovely. Dry as a bone. To the Unseen. Oh, is that the title? I must say it's rather wonderful. If this evening is a success, I shall start on the first draft tomorrow. How extraordinary it is. What? Oh, I don't know. Being right at the beginning of something. It gives one an odd feeling. Do you remember how I got the idea for The Light Goes Out? Yes, of course. We sat up half the night talking about it. She certainly came in very handy, that woman. I wonder who she was, and if she ever knew, I mean, ever recognised that description of herself. Poor thing. Here's to her, anyhow. Have another. Darling, it's most awfully strong. Never mind. Used Elvira to help you, when you were thinking something out, I mean? Oh, every now and then. When she concentrated. But she didn't concentrate very often. I do wish I'd known her. I wonder if you would have liked her. I'm sure I should. 
As you talk of her, she sounds enchanting. Yes, I'm sure I should have liked her, because you know I have never for an instant felt in the least jealous of her. And that's a good sign. Poor Elvira. Does it still hurt when you think of her? No, not really. Sometimes I almost wish it did. I feel rather guilty. I wonder if I died before you'd grown tired of me, if you'd forget me so soon. What a horrible thing to say. No, I think it's interesting. Well, to begin with, I have not forgotten Elvira. I remember her very distinctly indeed. I remember how fascinating she was, and how maddening. I remember how badly she played all games, and how cross she got when she didn't win. I remember her gay charm when she had achieved her own way over something, and her extreme acidity when she didn't. I remember her physical attractiveness, which was tremendous, and her spiritual integrity, which was nil. You can't remember something that was nil. I remember how morally untidy she was. Was she more physically attractive than I am? Oh, that's a very tiresome question, dear. It fully deserves the wrong answer. Hmm, you're really very sweet. Thank you. And a little naive, too. Why? Because you imagine that I mind about Elvira being more physically attractive than I am. I should have thought any woman would mind, if it were true. Or perhaps I'm old-fashioned in my view of female psychology. Not exactly old-fashioned, darling, just a bit didactic. What do you mean? It's didactic to attribute to one type the defects of another type. For instance, because you know perfectly well that Elvira would mind terribly if you found another woman more attractive physically than she was, it doesn't necessarily follow that I should. Elvira was a more physical person than I. I'm certain of that. It's all a question of degree. I love you, my love. I know you do. But not the wildest stretch of imagination could describe it as the first fine, careless rapture. Would you like it to be? Good God, no! Wasn't that a shade too vehement? We're neither of us adolescent, Charles. We've neither of us led exactly prim lives, have we? And we've both been married before. Careless rapture at this stage would be incongruous and embarrassing. I hope I haven't been in any way a disappointment, dear. Don't be so idiotic. After all, your first husband was a great deal older than you, wasn't he? I shouldn't like to think that you'd missed out all along the line. There are moments, Charles, when you go too far. Sorry, darling. As far as waspish female psychology goes, there's a strong vein of it in you. I've heard that said about Julius Caesar. Julius Caesar is neither here nor there. He may be, for all we know. We'll ask Madame Arcati. Oh, you're awfully irritating when you're determined to be witty at all costs. Almost supercilious. That's exactly what Elvira used to say. I'm not at all surprised. I never imagined, physically triumphant as she was, that she was entirely lacking in perception. Darling Ruth! As I think I mentioned before, I love you, my love. Poor Elvira. Didn't that light comradely kiss mollify you at all? You're very annoying, you know you are. When I said poor Elvira, it came from a heart. You must have bewildered her so horribly. Don't I ever bewilder you at all? Never for an instant I know every trick. Well, all I can say is we'd better get a divorce immediately. Put my glass down, there's a darling. She certainly had a great talent for living. It was a pity that she died so young. Poor Elvira. That remark's getting monotonous. Poor Charles, then. That's better. And later on, poor Ruth, I expect. You have no faith, Ruth. I really think you should try to have a little faith. I shall strain every nerve. Life without faith is an arid business. How beautifully you put things, dear. I aim to please. If I died, I wonder how long it would be before you married again. You won't die. You're not the dying sort. Neither was Elvira. Oh, yes, she was, now that I look back on it. She had a certain ethereal, not quite of this world quality. Nobody could call you even remotely ethereal. Nonsense! She was of the earth, earthy. Well, she is now, anyway. You know, that's the kind of observation that shocks people. It's discouraging to think how many people are shocked by honesty, and how few by deceit. Oh, write that down. You might forget it. You underrate me. 
Anyway, it was a question of bad taste more than honesty. I was devoted to Elvira. We were married for five years. She died. I missed her. Very much. It was seven years ago. I have now, with your help, my love, risen above the whole thing. Admirable. But if tragedy should darken our lives, I still say, with pathetic foreboding, poor Ruth. That's probably the Bradmans. It might be Madame Arcati. No, no, she'll come on her bicycle. She always goes everywhere on her bicycle. It really is very spirited of the old girl. Shall I go, or shall we let Edith have her fling? Wait a minute and see what happens. Perhaps she didn't hear. She's probably on one knee in the pre-sprinting position, waiting for Cook to open the kitchen door. <laughs> ah! Steady, Edith! Yes, sir! Doctor and Mrs. Bradman! We're not late, are we? I only got back from the hospital about half an hour ago. Of course not. Madame Arcati isn't here yet. That must have been her we passed coming down the hill. I said I thought it was. Then she won't be long. I'm so glad you were able to come. We've been looking forward to it. I'm really quite excited. I guarantee that Violet will be good. I made her promise. There wasn't any need. I'm absolutely thrilled. I've only seen Madame Arcati two or three times in the village. I mean, I've never seen her do anything at all peculiar, if you know what I mean. A dry martini? Oh, yes, by all means. She certainly is a strange woman. It was only a chance remark of a vicar's about seeing her up on the knoll on Midsummer's Eve, dressed in some sort of Indian robing, that made me realise she was psychic at all. Then I began to make inquiries. Apparently she's been a professional in London for years. It is funny, isn't it? I mean, anybody doing it is a profession. <laughs> I believe it can be rather lucrative, dear. Do you believe in it, Mrs. Condamine? Do you think there's anything really genuine about it at all? I'm afraid not. But I do think it's interesting how easily people allow themselves to be deceived. But she must believe in it herself, mustn't she? Or is the whole business a fake? I suspect the worst. A real professional charlatan. Well, that's what I'm hoping for anyway. A character I'm planning for my book must be a complete impostor. That's one of the most important factors of the whole story. What exactly are you hoping to get from her? Jargon, principally. A few of the tricks of the trade. I haven't been to a seance for years. I want to refresh my memory. Then it's not entirely new to you. Oh, no. When I was a little boy, an aunt of mine used to come and stay with us. She imagined that she was a medium and used to go off into the most elaborate trances after dinner. My mother was fascinated by it. Was she convinced? Good heavens, no. She just naturally disliked my aunt, and she loved to see her make a fool of herself. Oh, well, I gather there are never any tangible results. Oh, sometimes she didn't do so badly. On one occasion, when we were all sitting round in the pitch dark, with my mother groping her way through Chaminade on the piano, my aunt suddenly gave a shrill scream and said that she saw a small black dog by my chair. Then someone switched on the lights, and sure enough, there it was. Oh, how extraordinary! It was obviously a stray that had come in from the streets. But I must say, I took off my hat to Auntie for producing it. Or rather, utilising it. Even Mother was a bit shaken. What happened to it? It lived with us for years. I sincerely hope Madame Arcati won't produce any livestock. We have so very little room in this house. Do you think she tells fortunes? I love having my fortune told. Oh, I expect so. I was told once on a pier at Southsea that I was surrounded by lilies and a golden seven. It worried me for days. Uh, we really must be serious, you know. Pretend we all believe implicitly. Otherwise she won't play. Also, she might really mind. It would be cruel to upset her. I shall be as good as gold. Have you ever attended her, Doctor? Professionally, I mean? Yes, she had influenza in January. She's only been here just over a year, you know. I must say she was singularly unpsychic then. I always understood that she was an authoress. Oh yes, we originally met as colleagues at one of Mrs Wilmot's Sunday evenings in Sandgate. What sort of books does she write? Two sorts. Rather whimsical children's stories about enchanted woods filled with highly conversational flora and fauna and enthusiastic biographies of minor royalties. Very sentimental, reverent and extremely funny. Here she is. She knows, doesn't she, about tonight? I mean, you're not going to spring it on her. Oh, of course, it was all arranged last week. I told her how profoundly interested I was in anything to do with the occult. She blossomed like a rose. I really feel quite nervous. 
as though I was going to make a speech. I say, your maid's walking very slowly, isn't she? Oh, don't worry. It won't last all evening. Uh, you'd better go and meet her, darling. I've lent my bike up against that little bush. It will be perfectly all right if no one touches it. Madame Arcati, how nice of you to have come all this way. My dear Madame Arcati. I'm afraid I'm a little late, but I had a sudden presentiment that I was going to have a puncture, so I went back to fetch my pump. Would you take my cloak, dear? Thank you. And then, of course, I didn't have a puncture at all. Perhaps you will on the way home. Ah, Dr. Bradman, the man with the gentle hands. I'm delighted to see you looking so well. Yeah, this is my wife. Oh, we are old friends. We meet coming out of shops. Would you like a cocktail, Madame Arcati? If it's a dry martini, yes. If it's a concoction, no. Experience has taught me to be very wary of concoctions. It's a dry martini. Oh, how delicious. It was wonderful cycling through the woods this evening. I was deafened with birdsong. It's been lovely all day. Oh, but evening is for time, Mrs Condamine. Mark my words. Evening is for time, thank you. Cheers. 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 Uh, don't you find it very tiring, bicycling everywhere? On the contrary, it stimulates me. I was getting far too sedentary in London. That horrid little flat with the dim lights. They had to be dim, you know, because the clients expect it. I must say I find cycling very exhausting. Steady rhythm, that's what counts. Once you get the knack of it, you need never look back. On you get and away you go. But the hills, Madame Arcati, pushing up those awful hills. Just knack again. Down with your head, up with your heart, and you're over the top like a flash and skimming down the other side like a dragonfly. This is one of the best dry martinis I've had for years. Will you have another? Oh, well, certainly. You're a very clever man. Anybody can write books, but it takes an artist to bring a dry martini that's dry enough. Are you writing anything nowadays, Madame Arcati? Every morning, regular as clockwork, seven till one. Is it a novel or a memoir? It's a children's book. I have to finish it by the end of October to catch the Christmas sales. It's mostly about very small animals. The hero is a moss beetle. <laughs> I had to give up my memoir of Princess Pagliatani because she died in April. I talked to her about it the other day and she implored me to go on with it, but I really hadn't the heart. You talked to her about it the other day? Yes, through my control, of course. She sounded very irritable. Uh, it's funny to think of people in the spirit world being irritable, isn't it? Isn't it? I mean, one can hardly imagine it. Can one? Well, we have no reliable guarantee that the life after this will be any less exasperating than this one, have we? <laughs> Mr. Condamine, how can you? I expect it's dreadfully ignorant of me not to know. But who was Princess Pagliatani? She was originally a Jewess from Odessa of quite remarkable beauty. It was an accepted fact that people used to stand on the seats of railway stations to watch her whiz by. She was a keen traveller. In her younger days, yes. Later on she married a Mr. Clark in the consular service and settled down for a while. How did she become Princess Pagliatani? Oh, that was years later. Mr. Clark passed over. He left her penniless with two strapping girls. How unpleasant. So there was nothing for it but to obey the beckoning finger of adventure and take to the road again. So off she went bag and baggage to Vladivostok. What an extraordinary place to go. Oh, she had cousins there. Some years later she met old Pagliatani, who was returning from a secret mission in Japan. He was immediately staggered by her beauty and very shortly afterwards married her. From then on her life became really interesting. I would hardly have described it as dull before. What happened to the girls? She neither saw them nor spoke to them for twenty-three years. How extraordinary. Not at all. She was always very erratic emotionally. Dinner is served, Mum. Oh, thank you, Edith. Shall we? No red meat, I hope. There's meat, but I don't think it will be very red. Would you rather have an egg or something? Oh, no, thank you. It's just that I make it a rule never to eat red meat before I work. It sometimes has an odd effect. What sort of effect? Oh, nothing of the least importance. 
If it isn't very red, it won't matter much. Anyhow, we'll risk it. Come along, then. Mrs. Bradman, Madame Arcati, your Aunt Charles is right. <laughs> Now, does everyone have coffee? Good. On her mother's side, she went right back to the Borgias, which I think accounted for a lot one way or another. Even as a child, she was given to the most destructive tempers. Very inbred, you know. Yes, she must have been. My control was quite scared the other day when we were talking. I could hear it in her voice, after all. She is only a child. You have a child as a control? Yes, they're generally the best. Some mediums preferred Indians, of course, but personally I've always found them unreliable. In what way unreliable? Well, for one thing, they're frightfully lazy. And also, when faced with any sort of difficulty, they're very rather apt to go off into their own tribal language, which is naturally unintelligible. That generally spoils everything and wastes a great deal of time. No, children are undoubtedly more satisfactory, particularly when they get to know you and understand your ways. Daphne has worked with me for years. And she goes on being a child. I, I mean, I... Well, I, I suppose she shows no signs of growing any older. Time values on the other side, Mrs. Bradman, are utterly different from ours. Do you feel funny when you go off into a trance? In what way, funny? Uh, Mrs. Bradman doesn't mean funny in its comic implication. I think she meant odd or strange. The word was an unfortunate choice. Uh, yes, I'm sure I'm very sorry. It doesn't matter in the least. Please don't apologise. Uh, when did you first discover you had these extraordinary powers? When I was quite tiny. My mother was a medium before me, you know, and so I had every opportunity of starting on the ground floor, as you might say. I had my first trance when I was four years old, and my first ectoplasmic manifestation when I was five and a half. What an exciting day that was. I shall never forget it. Of course, the manifestation itself was quite small and of very short duration, but for a child of my tender years it was most gratifying. Your mother must have been so pleased. Oh, she was. Can you foretell the future? Certainly not. I disapprove of fortune tellers most strongly. Oh, why? Too much guesswork and fake mixed up with it, even when the gift is genuine, and it only very occasionally is. You can't count on it. Why not? Time again. Time is the reef upon which all our frail mystic ships are wrecked. You mean because it has never yet been proved that the past and the present and future are not one and the same thing? I long ago came to the conclusion that nothing has ever been definitely proved about anything. How very wise. Ah, Edith, yes, put the drinks on that little table, please. Oh, I'll move the cigarette box. Oh, and leave the dining room just as it is for tonight, Edith. You can clear the table in the morning. Yes, ma'am. And we don't want to be disturbed for the next hour for any reason whatsoever. Is that clear? Yes, ma'am. And if anyone should telephone, just say we are out and take a message. Uh, unless it's an urgent call for George. Unless it's an urgent call for Dr. Bradman. Yes, ma'am. My, that girl moves swiftly. There's not likely to be an urgent call for George, is there? Oh, no, I, I don't think so. Once I'm off, it won't matter. But an interruption during the preliminary stages might be disastrous. I wish the men would hurry up. I'm terribly excited. Oh, please don't be. It makes everything much more difficult. Well, Madame Arcati, here we are. The time is drawing near. Who knows? It may be receding. Well, how very true. I hope you feel in the mood, Madame Arcati. It isn't a question of mood. It's a question of concentration. You must forgive us for being impatient. We can perfectly easily wait, though, if you're not ready to start. Nonsense, my dear. I'm absolutely ready. Ah, now, if you'll all just take your places, and I'll just stand here. Hey-ho, hey-ho, to work we go. Is there anything you'd like us to do? Do? Yes, uh, hold hands or anything. Oh, all that will come later. I shall have to open the windows. Ah, first a few deep, deep breaths of fresh air. You may talk if you wish. You will not disturb me in the least. Hmm. Ah, ah. 
Hmm. Ah. Oh, dear. Shh. By the way, my dear, that was an excellent hmm. dinner. I congratulate ah. you. I'm afraid the mousse wasn't quite right. Hmm. Well, it ah. looked a bit hysterical, but it tasted hmm. it. That cuckoo is very angry. I beg your pardon? I said that cuckoo is very angry. Listen. How can you tell? Timbra. No moon. Rats as well. There's mist rising from the marshes. Oh, there's no need for me to light my bicycle lamp as well. I mean, nobody's likely to fall over it. Uh, we're not expecting anyone else. Yeah. Good night, you foolish bird. You have a table? Uh, yes, we thought this one would do. I think the one that has the drinks on it would be better. Change over then. Ah, uh, you told Edith we didn't want to be disturbed. Yes, darling. Ah, ah, this is the moment I always hate. Are you nervous? Yes. When I was a girl, I always used to be sick. How fortunate that you grew out of it. Children are always much more prone to be sick than grown-ups, though, aren't they? I mean, I know I could never travel in a train with any degree of safety until I was fourteen. Is she going to sit down? Uh, I don't think so. At least not yet. Little Tommy Tucker sings for his supper. What shall he have but brown bread and butter? I despise that because it doesn't rhyme at all. But Daphne loves it. Who's Daphne? Daphne is Madame Arcati's control. She's a little girl. Oh, I see. Yes, of course. Uh, how old is she? Rising seven when she died. And when was that? February the 6th, 1884. Poor little thing. She must be getting a bit long in the tooth by now, I should think. You should think, Dr. Bradman, but I fear you don't. At least not profoundly enough. Do be quiet, George. You'll put Madame Arcati off. <laughs> don't worry, my dear. I am quite used to sceptics. They generally turn out to be the most vulnerable and receptive in the long run. You'd better take that warning to heart, Dr. Bradman. Oh, please forgive me, Madame Arcati. I assure you, I am most deeply interested. It is of no consequence. Please, please, sit round the table. Place your hands downwards on it. Yes. Come, Mrs. Bradman. Uh, what about the lights? All in good time, Mr. Condamine. Sit down, please. Your fingers should be touching. That's right. I presume that that is the gramophone, Mr. Condamine? Yes. Would you like me to start it? It's an electric one. Please, stay where you are. I can manage. Now, let's see, what do we have? Brahms? Oh, dear me, no. Rachmaninoff? Oh, oh too florid. Where is the dance music? There are the loose ones on the left. Ah, I see. I'm afraid none of them are very new. Oh, Daphne is really more attached to Irving Berlin than anybody else. She likes a tune she can hum. Ah, here's one. Always. Uh, always? Do sit down, Charles. What's the matter? Uh, nothing. Nothing at all. The light switches by the door? Yes. All except a small one on the desk and the gramophone. Very well. I understand. Charles, do keep still. Fingers touching, George. Remember what Madame Arcati said. Now, there are one or two things that I should like to explain. So will you all listen attentively? Of course. Presently, when the music begins, I am going to switch out the lights. I may then either walk about the room for a little while or lie down flat. In due course, I shall draw up this dear little stool and join you at the table. And then I shall place myself between you and your wife, Mr. Condamine and I shall rest my hands lightly upon yours. I must ask you not to address me, or move, or do anything in the least distracting. Is that quite, quite clear? Perfectly. Of course, I cannot guarantee that anything will happen at all. Daphne may be unavailable. She had a head cold very recently and was rather under the weather, poor child. On the other hand, a great many things might occur. One of you might have an emanation, for instance. Or we might contact a poltergeist, which would be extremely destructive and noisy. 
In what way destructive? Who oh, they throw things, you know. I didn't know. But we must cross that bridge when we come to it, mustn't we? Certainly, by all means. Fortunately, an elemental at this time of year is most unlikely. What do elementals do? Oh, my dear, one never can tell. They're dreadfully unpredictable. Usually they take the form of a very cold wind. I don't think I shall like that, occasionally reaching almost hurricane velocity. You don't think it would be a good idea to take the more breakable ornaments off the mantelpiece before we start? Oh, that really is not necessary, Mrs. Condamine. I assure you I have my own methods of dealing with elementals. I'm so glad. Now then, are you ready to empty your minds? You mean try to think of nothing? Absolutely nothing, Dr. Bradman. Concentrate on a space or a nondescript colour. That's really the best way. I'll do my damnedest. Good work! Now, I will start the music. Now the lights! Oh dear, quiet, please! Is there anyone there? Is there anyone there? One rap for yes, two raps for no. Now then, is there anyone there? Oh, please be quiet, Mrs. Bradman. Is that you, Daphne? Is your cold better, dear? Oh, I'm so sorry. Are you doing anything for it? I'm afraid she's rather fretful. Is there anyone there who wishes to speak to anyone here? Ah, now we're getting somewhere. Uh, no, Daphne, don't do that, dear. No, you're hurting me. Daphne, please, dear, no. Oh, please, be good, there's a dear child. Now, you say there is someone there who wishes to speak to someone here. Is it me? Is it Dr. Bradman? Is it Mrs. Bradman? Is it Mrs. Condamine? Stop it! Stop it! Behave yourself! Is it Mr. Condamine? There is someone who wishes to speak to you, Mr. Condamine. Tell them to leave a message. I really must ask you not to be flippant, Mr. Condamine. Charles, how can you be so idiotic? You'll spoil everything. Sorry, it slipped out. Do you know anybody who has passed over recently? No, not recently. Except my cousin in the civil service. And he wouldn't be likely to want to communicate with me. We haven't spoken for years. Are you Mr Condamine's cousin in the civil service? I'm afraid we've drawn a blank. Can't you think of anyone else? Rack your brains. It might be old Mrs Plummet, you know. She died on Whit Monday. I can't imagine why old Mrs Plummet would wish to talk to me... We had very little in common. It's worth trying, anyhow. Are you old, Mrs. Plummet? She was very deaf. Perhaps you'd better shout. Are you old, Mrs. Plummet? There was nobody there at all. How disappointing, just as we were getting on so nicely. Why, let's be quiet. Well, I'm afraid there's nothing for it but for me to go into a trance. I had hoped to avoid it because it is so exhausting. However... What must be, must be. Excuse me a moment while I start the gramophone again. Uh, not always. Please don't play that again. Why ever not, Charles? Don't be absurd. I'm afraid I must. It would be imprudent to change horses in midstream, if you know what I mean. Oh, have it your own way. Tucker sings for his supper. What should he have? Brown bread and butter. That'll be Daphne. She ought to have her adenoids out. George, please. Ah! Ah! Good grief. Is she all right, Charles? All right, let me see. Uh, she's just fainted. The table. It's trying to get away. I can't hold it. Press down hard. There. Oh! What way to pick it up? Or leave it where it is. How oh, the hell do I know? There's no need to snap at me, George. I'm sorry, but... Leave it where it is. 
Who said that? Who said what? Somebody said leave it where it is. Nonsense, dear. I heard it distinctly. Well, nobody else did, did they? I didn't hear a sound. It was you, playing tricks. I am not doing anything of the sort. I haven't uttered. Good evening, child. Ventriloquism. That's what it was. Ventriloquism. What's the matter with you? You must have heard that. One of you must have heard it. Heard what? You mean to sit there solemnly and tell me that none of you heard anything at all? Well, I certainly didn't. Neither did I. I wish I had. I should love to hear something. It's you playing the tricks, Charles. You're acting to try and frighten us. I'm not. I swear I'm not. It's difficult to think of what to say after seven years. But I suppose good evening is as good as anything else. Who are you? Elvira, of course. Don't be so silly. Right, that's it, that's enough. I can't bear this for another minute. Get up, everybody. The entertainment's over. Oh, Charles, how tiresome of you. Just as we were beginning to enjoy ourselves. Never again, that's all I can say. Never, never again, as long as I live. What on earth is the matter with you? Nothing's the matter with me. I'm just sick of the whole business, that's all. Listen, Charles, did you hear anything that we didn't hear? Really? No. No, of course not. I was pretending. I knew you were. Oh, dear. Look at Madame Arcati. She's still spark out. What are we going to do with her? Bring her round, I suppose. Bring her round as soon as possible. Now, I really think we'd better leave her alone. But she might stay there for hours. The pulse is all right. Bring her round! Surely it's dangerous to leave her like that. Really, Charles, you're behaving most peculiarly. Madame Arcati, will you wake up? Wake up! It's time to go home! Here, yeah, easy, old man. I'll get a brandy. Yes, get some brandy. Uh, give her some brandy. Uh, lift her into the chair now. Help me, Bradman. Oh, wake up, Madame Arcati! Little Tommy Tucker, Madame Arcati! Here's the brandy. Drink this. Drink it and wake up! Oh, she's coming round. Be careful, Charles, you're spilling it down her dress. Well, oh, that's that. Are you all right, Madame Arcati? Certainly I am. I've never felt better in all my life. Would you like some more brandy? So that's the funny taste in my mouth. Well, really, fancy allowing them to give me brandy, Dr. Bradman. You ought to have known better. Brandy on top of a trance might have been catastrophic. Take it away, please. I probably shan't sleep a wink tonight as it is. Well, I know I shan't. Why on earth not? The whole experience has unhinged me. Well, what happened? Was it satisfactory? Nothing much happened, Madame Arcati, after you went off. <laughs> Something happened, all right. I can feel it. Hmm. No poltergeist, at any rate. That's a good thing. Any apparitions? Not a thing. No ectoplasm? Well, I'm not quite sure what that is, Madame Arcati, but we didn't see anything, no. That's very curious. I feel as though something tremendous had taken place. Charles pretended he heard a voice in order to frighten us. It was only a joke. A very poor one, if I may say so. Nevertheless, I am prepared to swear that there is someone else psychic in this room, apart from myself. I don't know how they can be, really, Madame Arcati. Well, I, I do hope I haven't gone and released something. However, we're bound to find out in a day or two. If any manifestation should occur, or you hear any unexpected noises, you might let me know at once. We will, I assure you. We'll telephone immediately. Well, I think I must be on my way now. Wouldn't you like anything before you go? No, thank you. I have some Ovaltine already in a saucepan at home. It only needs hotting up. Wouldn't you like to leave your bicycle here and let us drive you? I honestly think you should, Madame Arcati. After that trance and everything, you can't be feeling quite yourself. Nonsense, my dear. I'm as fit as a fiddle. Always feel capital after a trance. Rejuvenates me. Good night, Mrs. Condamine. It was awfully sweet of you to take so much trouble. I'm so sorry so little occurred. Must be that cold of Daphne's, I expect. You know what children are when they have anything wrong with them. We must try again some other evening. That would be lovely. Good night, Mrs. Bradman. 
It was thrilling, it really was. I felt the table absolutely shaking under my hands. Good night, Doctor. Congratulations, Madame Arcati. I am fully aware of the irony in your voice, Dr. Bradman. As a matter of fact, you'd be an admirable subject for telepathic hypnosis. A great chum of mine is an expert. I should like her to look you over. I'm sure I should be charmed. Good night, everyone. Next time we must really put our backs into it. Oh, my goodness. What an evening. I'll pick up some of the furniture. Oh, dear, oh, dear. I do hope she's all right. I'm sure the routine, like the bicycle, is well oiled. <laughs> Be careful, Mrs. Condamine. She might hear you. I can't help it. I really can't. I've been holding it in for ages. Well, she certainly put you in your place, George. Serve you right. She's raving mad, of course. She must be mad as a hatter. Do you think she really believes? Of course not. As I said, the whole thing is a put-up job. But I must say, she shoots a more original line than they generally do. I should think she's probably half convinced herself by now. Possibly. The trance is genuine enough, you know. But then that is easily accounted for. Hysteria? Yes, a form of hysteria, I should imagine. But I do hope Mr Condamine got all the atmosphere he wanted for his book. He might have got a great deal more if he hadn't spoiled everything by showing off. I'm really very cross with him. Oh, I say, I suddenly felt quite a draught. There must be a window open. Ah, uh, no, they're shut now. Perhaps it was one of those watch columns that Madame Arcati was talking about. Elementals. Oh, no, it couldn't be. She distinctly said it was the wrong time of year for elementals. Well, the old girl's gone peddling off down the drive at a hell of a speed. We had a bit of trouble lighting her lamp. <laughs> Poor thing. I've got a theory about her, you know. I believe she's completely sincere. Charles, how could she be? Well, wouldn't it be possible, Doctor? Some form of self-hypnotism? Well, it might be. As I was explaining to your wife just now, there are certain types of hysterical subjects. George, dear, it's getting terribly late. We really must go home. You've got to get up early in the morning. Ah, you see. The moment I begin to talk about anything that really interests me, my wife interrupts me. You know I'm right, darling. It's past eleven. I'll do a little reading up on the business, just for the fun of it. Uh, you must have a drink before you go. Oh, really, thank you. Well, that's quite right, I'm afraid. I do have to get up abominably early tomorrow. I've got a patient being operated on in Canterbury. It's been a thrilling evening, Ruth, dear. I shall never forget it. It was sweet of you to include us. Good night, Mrs. Condamine. Thank you so much. You're sure about the drink? Quite sure, thanks. We'll let you know if we find any poltergeists whirling around. Why, well, I should never forgive you if you didn't. Come along, darling. Ah. Well, darling. Well, would you say the evening had been profitable? Yes, I suppose so. I must say it was extremely funny at moments. Yes, it certainly was. What's the matter? The matter? Yes, you seem odd somehow. Do you feel quite well? Perfectly. Just need a drink, that's all. Do you want one? No, thank you, dear. It's rather chilly in this room. Come over by the fire. I don't think I'll make any notes tonight. I'll start fresh in the morning. Oh, my God! Charles! That was very clumsy, Charles, dear. Elvira, it's true. It was you. Of course it was. Charles, what are you talking about? Are you a ghost? I suppose I must be. It's all very confusing. I can't feel the heat of this fire. Charles, what do you keep looking over there for? Look at me. What's happened to you? What, don't you see? See what? Elvira. Elvira? Yes. Elvira, dear, this is Ruth. Ruth. This is Elvira. Now come and sit down, Charles. Come and sit down, darling. Do you mean to say you can't see her? Listen, Charles, you've got to sit down quietly there for a moment by the fire. I'll mix you another drink. Now, I don't want you to worry about the mess on the carpet because Edith can clean that up in the morning. 
But you must be able to see her. She's there, right in front of you. There! Are you mad? What's happened to you? You can't see her? Look, if this is a joke, Charles, it's gone quite far enough. Sit down, for God's sake, and don't be idiotic. Oh, what am I to do? What the hell am I to do? I think you might be a little more pleased to see me. After all, you conjured me up. I didn't do any such thing. Nonsense, of course you did. That awful child with a cold came and told me that you wanted to see me urgently. Well, that was a mistake. A horrible mistake. Stop talking like that, Charles. I told you before, the joke's gone far enough. I've gone mad. That's what it is. I've just gone raving mad. Here, drink this. This is appalling. Relax. How can I relax? I shall never be able to relax again as long as I live. Drink some of the brandy. There. Right. You satisfied? Now sit down. Why are you so anxious for me to sit down? What good will that do? I want you to relax. You can't relax standing up. African natives can. They stand on one leg for hours. I do not happen to be an African native. You don't happen to be what? An African native! Well, what's that got to do with it? It doesn't matter, Ruth, really. It doesn't matter. We'll say no more about it. Huh. Right. See? I've sat down. Would you like some more brandy? Yes, please. Well, that's very unwise, because you always had a weak head. I could drink you under the table. There's no need to be aggressive, Charles. I'm doing my best to help you. I'm sorry. Here, drink this, and then we'll go to bed. Get rid of her, Charles. Then we can talk in peace. That's a thoroughly immoral suggestion. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. What is there immoral in that? I wasn't talking to you. Well, who were you talking to then? Elvira, of course. To hell with Elvira! There now. She's getting cross. I don't blame her. What don't you blame her for? Oh, God. Now look here, Charles. I gather you've got some sort of plan behind all this. I'm not quite a fool. I suspected you when we were doing that idiotic seance. Oh, don't be silly. What plan could I have? I don't know. It's probably something to do with the characters in your book. How they or one of them would react in a certain situation. Well, I refuse to be used as a guinea pig unless I'm warned beforehand what it's all about. Elvira is here, Ruth. She's standing a few yards away from you. Yes, dear. I can see her distinctly. Under the piano with a zebra. But, Ruth, I am not going to stay here arguing any longer. Hooray! Shut up! How dare you speak to me like that? Listen, Ruth, please, listen. I will not listen to any more of this nonsense. I am going up to bed now, and I shall leave you to turn out the lights. I shan't be asleep. I am too upset. So you can come in and say good night to me, if you feel like it. Ooh, that's big of her, I must say. Be quiet. You're behaving like a gutter snipe. Well, that is all I have to say. Good night, Charles. Ruth! <laughs> oh, that's one of the most enjoyable half hours I have ever spent. Elvira, how could you? Poor Ruth. Now, this is obviously a hallucination, isn't it? I'm afraid I don't know the technical term for it. What am I to do? What Ruth suggested. Relax. Where have you come from? Do you know it's very peculiar? But I've sort of forgotten. Are you going to be here indefinitely? I don't know that either. Oh, my God. Why would you hate it so much if I was? Well, you must admit it would be embarrassing. I don't see why, really. It's all a question of adjusting yourself. Anyway, I think it's horrid of you to be so unwelcoming and disagreeable. Now, look here, Elvia. I do. I think you're mean. Try to see my point, dear. I've been married to Ruth for five years, and you've been dead for seven. Not, not dead, Charles. Passed over. It's considered vulgar to say dead where I come from. Passed over, then. At any rate, now that I'm here, the least you can do is to make a pretense of being amiable about it. Yes, of course, my dear. I'm delighted in one way. I don't believe you love me any more. I shall always love the memory of you. You mustn't think me unreasonable. But I really am a little hurt. 
you called me back, and at great inconvenience I came. And you've been thoroughly churlish ever since I arrived. Believe me, Elvira, I most emphatically did not send for you. There has been some mistake. Well, somebody did, and that child said it was you. I remember I was playing backgammon with a very sweet old oriental gentleman. I think his name was Genghis Khan. I'd just thrown double sixes, and then this child paged me, and the next thing I knew I was in this room. Perhaps it was your subconscious. You must find out whether you're going to stay or not. Uh, we can make arrangements accordingly. I don't see how I can. Well, try to think. Isn't there anyone that you know that you can get in touch with over there, on the other side or whatever it's called, who could advise you? I can't think. It seems so far away, as though I'd dreamed it. You must know somebody else besides Genghis Khan. Oh, Charles, what is it? I want to cry. But I don't think I'm able to. It's seeing you again, and you being so irascible, like you always used to be. I don't mean to be irascible, Elvira. Darling, I don't really mind. I never did. Is it cold, being a ghost? No, I don't think so. What happens if I touch you? I doubt if you can. Do you want to? Oh, Elvira! What is it, darling? I really do feel strange seeing you again. That's better. What's better? Your voice was kinder. Was I ever unkind to you when you were alive? Often. Oh, how can you? I'm sure that's an exaggeration. Not at all. You were an absolute pig that time we went to Cornwall and stayed in that awful hotel. You hit me with a billiard cue. Only very, very gently. I loved you very much. I loved you too. Ah, I can't touch you. Isn't that horrible? Perhaps it's as well, if I'm going to stay for any length of time. I suppose I'll wake up eventually. But I feel strangely peaceful now. That's right. Put your head back. Like that? Yes. I'm stroking your hair. Can you feel anything? Just a very little breeze. Well, that's better than nothing. I suppose if I'm really out of my mind, it'll put me in an asylum. <laughs> Don't worry about that. Just relax. Oh, poor Ruth. Hmm. To hell with Ruth. <laughs>